Now, as you remain standing, if you would take your copy of Scripture and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 17 will be our text for this morning. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You can follow on the screen behind me if you so choose. Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the uh, adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be a guarantee to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Let's pray together. Now, our Father, it is our privilege, our joy to be able to come to this text and be able to consider what it says to us. I pray that it would be encouraging and helpful to us. I pray that we're able to focus and put aside all the cares of this life Give attention to your word as you speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I do want to come to our text, but I, I feel like it's important to take just a few minutes uh, to consider what happened this week in Uvalde, Texas. And I know that you're all aware of it, so we'll not have to rehash all those details and, and talk about that in particular. But what I wanted to is take the time to speak to it, because if there's any time that there's a crisis or a need or a situation, um, the church ought to speak to it. The Bible ought to speak to that. The politicians are speaking to it. Um, the education system is speaking to it. Law enforcement is speaking to it. So let's take a minute and think about it biblically. I'm not taking a lot of time, but I think there's some important things that we need to recognize and see, because as you and I both know, um, it was a premeditated uh, decision that this young man has made. And so we ask definitely um, that God would work in the family of that young man uh, to bring any of those who would be in relation to him to a place of salvation. But also we recognize this, that we will always have evil. And we can affirm the, the evilness, the, the sin of sinfulness, if you will. We can affirm that that's always going to be true, that our hearts are desperately wicked without Christ. Who can know it, Jeremiah says in chapter 17, verse 9. Who can know the depths of how evil and how grotesque and, and how deep um, the wickedness of man can be. And it's just revealed in a situation like this. And so we recognize that there will always be evil, and these kinds of situations will always exist because laws do not change it. When we have a lawless nation, more laws don't make it better. And so laws are not going to change it. The politicians are not going to change it. The education system is not going to change it. Um, and all the, the blame and the uh, shouting as to who and why this happened, um, remember that we're going to hear um, answers from psychology. We're going to hear answers from sociology. Uh, we're going to hear answers from the politicians. Uh, people are going to say, well, they don't need to have their kids in public school. People are going to say, well, they don't need to have, um, um, they need to have more uh, armed teachers in school. Uh, be all that as it is. That's the answer you're going to get. But here's the answer that comes from the Bible, what I just said. We affirm that, that their sin is great, that man will always sin. And regardless of the laws that are put in place, these kinds of things will happen. These um, un 
um, provoked, premeditated kinds of attacks will always ha happen. It's been throughout history, and it will always be part of history. But here's something that you need to think about. If it weren't for common grace, if it weren't for God's goodness to restrain that evil, we would be seeing that every day. It would be in the headlines every week. The fact that it is occasional makes a huge difference in how we think about it. It, it causes us to be reminded that, that the moral restraints that God has given through government, through law, to, to um, um, make sure that man and all of his evil doesn't go beyond a certain place in time is good. We need to be thankful for that. Now, it's still manifested, and those laws and all of those um, obstacles and all of those guards that we put in place to somehow prevail upon the conscience of man, um, that's what they are. They're, they're just laws. They're just obstacles, and we recognize that it weren't for, if it weren't for those, um, it would be much more tragic than what it happened this week. But the other thing that we need to recognize, too, is that the, the cross or the gospel is the only remedy to this, isn't it? I mean, if there's anything that we know, more um, guns or less guns or more politicians or less politicians or uh, metal detectors in the school or arming teachers, um, those things aren't really the answer. The gospel is the answer. And so what God has called us to is to be faithful to preach the gospel. What God has called us to is to make sure that we boldly and proudly, unashamedly, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, unashamedly preach the gospel and recognize that only by changing the hearts of men will things like this become less and less. And certainly, we need to uh, grieve with those who grieve. We need to recognize that there are families this Sunday morning that are waking up, and their life will never be the same, will it? It'll never be the same. And we grieve with them breaks our heart that sin would be so evil, and yet we know that it is. And so, look, it ought not to shock us. It ought not to shock us because evil is so intent to destroy and kill and take advantage, and certainly we see that in this situation. I know that this is true. This is not the last word. A school shooting, whether it be now or perhaps in the future, that's not the last word. The last word is God. He will hold accountable evil and bring to justice evil. And what we, what we tend to want is justice in this situation. And it's good. God created us to want justice. And somehow we feel cheated that justice was not given in the fact that this young man didn't have to go stand before a court of law and he didn't have to make some kind of testimony as to what he was doing and explain himself. But we, justice for him will come. That's why we pray that his family, anybody who's associated with him, would be saved. And that's why you pray and I pray that the gospel would flood Uvalde, Texas. That the people that are there would hear the gospel boldly, they would hear the gospel truly, and that many would come to saving faith. And so this, this murderer 
and let's call it what it is, he doesn't have the last word. Right? God has the last word. And that's where our hope is. That's where justice is. That's where righteousness is. That's where truth is. And so of all the things that you're going to be hearing about and the news reports and all the sociological explanations and societal explanations and the solutions that they offer, every time you hear that, remember that the gospel is the answer, right? And that's why we need to be speaking about this in public. We need to be speaking about this in private. We need to make sure that people understand the seriousness of the situation, no doubt. But we need to make sure that they understand that the Bible speaks to this. And God has the last word. In conversation yesterday at a memorial service, there were several conversations private conversations that I had to speak into this issue and say some of the very same things that I'm speaking to you right now. And in fact, I had another conversation earlier this week about the same thing. It was a private conversation, and y'all come back. Cafe. But it was about the same thing. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. Know that the gospel is the answer. Be bold in that. Be faithful to live the gospel as much as you preach it. And let's worship the Lord, right? Let's give him honor. From where does our help come from? Our help comes from him. Well, let's go to our text and think about what it says to us here. As um, It's not a very long text, and it's relatively simple. And so... We come to what we've been looking at for several weeks now. The Apostle Paul is so caught up in this this explanation, in his explanation of the gospel to the Christians at Rome, he just cannot get past this doctrine of justification by faith alone. He just can't get past it. He's been talking about it since chapter 3, verse 21, and we're still not done with it. We're right in the middle of this argument. In fact, it's going to go to the end of chapter 4, and look how chapter 5, verse 1 begins. Look at chapter 5, real quick, verse 1. But therefore, since we have been justified by faith. That's what he's been arguing. And when we come to chapter 5, it's going to be the culmination of his argument, of his putting forth the reality of justification by faith alone. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have. We'll come to that in the future. But for now, let's consider the argument because it's been uh, an argument in which the apostle has used Abraham as the example that would be the model for justification by faith, the Old Testament patriarch Abraham. Now, can I just say this? I'm going to take one sidestep over here and say this justification by faith alone is the heart of the gospel. That's why Paul is putting so much time and energy in explaining this particular doctrine to the Christians at Rome. Remember, he's going to come visit them. And he's going to go on his way to Spain, but he wants to come and mutually edify one another. That is, he and they. But he wants to establish for them the gospel. And and so he's writing this very important letter that that creates and helps us to, to create the right kind of thinking and biblical understanding of justification by faith. How is a man or a woman made right with God? And once we answer this question, look, then you don't have to, you have to, you no longer have to wonder. You no longer have to guess, well, I wonder what God wants me to do. Well, I wonder what things I can do to make God love me more. How can I make sure that I, I'm truly, truly a born-again person? How do I make sure that? Well, you understand justification by faith alone. 
That's how you do it. And you can quit trying to earn some kind of approval by God. Quit trying to earn some standing before him. Quit trying to do enough that he accepts you. Because it's been done for you. And you believe it by faith. And you are justified before God because you believe. I know that sounds really simple, doesn't it? Because what cries out within you, what cries out within me, is no, I need to do something. I mean, God's not just going to take me just because I believe. But that's what the Bible teaches. That's why Paul is so adamant in this argument. That's why he lays before us Abraham as an example. Because that is how God accepts you. That is how you are justified, made right with him. That is how you are saved, by belief, by faith. Because if it was by works, we couldn't do enough. If it, every day would be a grind trying to figure out what I need to do today so that God would accept me. And the truth of the matter is, God's already accepted the works of one who did them for you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and fulfilled the demands of the law that God expects everyone to be perfect, everyone to be perfectly righteous before him. Couldn't do it. Can't do it. Won't do it. But Jesus did. And that is what justification by faith is. And, and so, look, it is so important that churches can thrive when they preach this. Or they'll die if they don't. It's that important. Christians will thrive and they will grow in their Christian life. Or they will die believe, either believing or rejecting this justification by faith alone. You know, um, many of you are familiar with Ligonier Ministries. It's the ministry that R.C. Sproul started years ago. And, and um, every two years, they do a theological, a state of theology survey, a state of theology survey. And uh, it asks just to questions of believers. So the, the survey is done for believers, not outside of the church. And one of the things that they found from the 2018 survey to the 2020 survey was a decrease in the understanding, a clear understanding of justification by faith alone in the church. In other words, what they begin to recognize that people in the church were trying to earn their acceptance before God. They were trying to work their own self-righteousness to be accepted by God. And there, that has continued, apparently, to decrease since 2018, or at least it's since 2020. So we've got to be straight on this, and this is why Paul put so much effort into it. Now, we're not going to be able to to finish all the chapter, obviously. That's why I broke it down in this smaller text for you. And so let's look at it quickly, see what Paul teaches us here. Verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world, look at this, did not come through the law. Now this is the first thing that is established here by Paul and that he tells us what he's told us so far. Let me just say it this way. What he's told us about so far in chapter 4 is justification before God by faith is not by works. That's verses 1 through 8 of chapter 4. It's not by works. And then people are justified before God by faith alone and not by circumcision. This is verses 9, 10, 11, and 12 of chapter 4. It's not by works. It's not by circumcision. 
Now, in these verses, verses 14, uh, really, verses 13 through 25, he's going to say that man, people, are not justified by the law. So it's not by works, your good deeds, your self-righteous efforts, your religious duties. It's not by rituals, religious rituals like circumcision, baptism. It's not that, that you're justified before God, and now it's not by law that you're justified before God. That's what he says there in verse 13, right? He says, look, the promise that Abraham received, it, that he would be the heir of the world, did not come through the law or through the righteousness of faith. It didn't come through the law. It came through the fact that Abraham, listen, Abraham believed God's word, and because he believed God's word, he was counted, he was reckoned, he was credited as righteous. Now contrast that to Adam in the garden who did not believe God's word and plunged all of humanity into this condemnation of sin, unrighteousness. And so now that's how we are conceived and that's how we're birthed as sinners, condemned. That's why the new birth is so necessary. So the promise what are we looking at here in verse 13 when it says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world. Where is that in Scripture? Because I, I promise you, you won't find those that promise word for word. But I will show you this. If you will, go back to Genesis. Keep your place in Romans. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. And I want you to go to Romans uh, rather, Gal Genesis, I'm all over the place. I want to go to Galatians. I want to be in Genesis. I got some things I want to say in Second Peter, and it's 11:30. Genesis chapter 12, verse one. Look at this. Now the Lord said to Abram, "Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you." And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now think about this. Think about it. Abraham is a pagan. He's a Gentile pagan. There's no law that he's abiding, abiding by. There's no circumcision that he has experienced. He's a pagan, and God speaks to him. And Abraham goes. Now look in chapter 12, verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And the reason I'm wanting you to read verse 7 is because I want to emphasize just for a moment this idea of to your offspring. Notice what he said back in verse 3, that I will bless those who bless you. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 2, I will make a you of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what are we talking about here? This, this idea of being made a great nation, this promise of land, this promise of offspring. Remember that Abraham is a pagan, and remember that it is childless. He has no children. And he really has no prospect of having children. He, 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 he is actually wanting one of his um, slaves to be his heir. But nevertheless, 
the promise is made that these these blessings, this blessing, particularly the blessing that will come through Jesus Christ, one of his offspring, one of his descendants, will bless the whole earth. And so we have Abraham with the Jewish nation, and we have the story of um, Isaac and Jacob and Judah and Joseph, and the, the whole storyline of the scripture is this descendant of Abraham who is going to bless the whole world. That's what Romans chapter 4, verse 13 is talking about. That promise, that promise is being seen and recognized by the Apostle Paul. He's just summarizing all of what God had said, and you can read more of the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. We looked at that briefly last Sunday morning. But this is the point, that what God said, Abraham believed, it did not come through the law. The law is going to come 400 years later. Circumcision is going to come later. That's why Paul keeps emphasizing this, that it's not by law, it's not by circumcision, and it's not by works. It's by faith alone. Now, verse 14. For he explains, he, he explains now, if it were of law, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, if it's the heirs who obey and abide by the law, then what? Number one, faith is null. It, it's canceled out. Faith has no place, no part. And two, the promise is void. The promise that God had made to Abraham that there would be one of his descendants, the Messiah, to come who would bless the world, that promise would be void. So faith is null and the promise is void. So it's not, again, by adhering to the law. It's not the law that would cause salvation and one to be made right with God. It's by faith. Verse 15, for the law brings wrath. So if you're going to keep the law, Paul says, if you're going to abide by the law and you think that the keeping the law somehow credits you a righteousness before God, you're going to find that you're failing and you cannot do it. And what it's going to bring upon you is wrath, condemnation. You can't keep the law. And the law is a good thing. The law is given sort of as this intermediate relationship. Here's the promise of Abraham over here that we just read, given to Abraham by God, and it is in chapter 12, and it's in chapter 15, it's in chapter 17 of Genesis. And then what happens? God gives the law. The law is a tutor. It's a guide so that you might know that you cannot be saved by it. All that it will do is condemn you. It gives you no hope. You have no salvation in the law. And the keeping of it will gain you nothing but condemnation. That's what he's saying here. So if we don't have faith, then we have the law. And if we have the law, then we're going to have wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. In other words, the law is important. It's holy, just, righteous, good. The law has a purpose. And you will be condemned if you do not keep the law. But it's by faith that one is made righteous. Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace. This is the heart of it, y'all. This is the heart of the text. This is the heart of everything that Paul is saying. That you would be saved by faith, and it is grace. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So the reason that we can know that it's not by law and it's not by circumcision and it's not by works is so that grace can be expanded, so that grace can be recognized. Th that's why we can come to this table with joy. That's why we can come to this worship time, this gathering of the church with joy and with anticipation because grace, by grace you are saved, right? 
And so it is by faith, by grace, through faith, in Christ. And notice that it says, not only to the adherent of the law, but even if the one who is adhering to the law would believe by faith, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham. So the grace is guaranteed to all those who believe by faith. They follow Abraham's example. He's the father of us all who believe by faith. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. That is what God said to Abraham. And it was said, of course, in God's presence. And notice what it does. It glorifies who God is. He believed God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So Abraham believed God's word. And that's really the key, isn't it? Because remember, I've told you this several times. It's worth repeating. It's not that somebody believes in God for their salvation. It's that they believe what God has said about salvation, right? If they believe what it, people will tell you all the time, oh, I believe in God. But what we want to know is do they believe in what God has said, that they are condemned and they will die and go to hell unless they believe by faith in Jesus Christ? Will you believe? Believe what God says. And be saved from the wrath to come. And so this becomes then the core, the heart of Paul's argument. And we'll look in verses 18 through 25 uh, uh, next Sunday morning. We'll share that and we'll go a little further. And then we'll see the results and the ramifications for those of us who believe by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then the question is this, would you believe? Would you quit hanging on to your self-righteousness or your rituals or any works that you would do? Would you let off of those and come and believe by faith alone in Christ alone? Now, works and rituals are important. They become the evidence of one who is truly born again. They become significant. They become means of grace for the believer to grow in grace and knowledge and grow in Christ-likeness. But they are the evidence that one has been justified by faith alone. Would you be saved today? Would you be justified before God because you have believed in what God has said about himself and about sin and about judgment? Let's pray together.